Welcome to Casual Friday. I'm going to put some links down in the description that tells you what all is included in this video uh, that will allow you to jump forward if you would like. I want to start by explaining something about how my channel works that might help you find videos that you're looking for. Like if you're wondering if I ever did a video on a certain topic or if you're wondering or if you have a suggestion for something maybe you'd like me to do on a casual Friday and just aren't sure if I've already covered that topic before. What you may not know is that every time I upload a video, I add that video to a playlist on my channel. Technique Tuesday videos are sometimes added to more than one playlist. So recently, for example, I did some videos on the long tail cast on, like doing a reversible edge to the long tail cast on. And those videos would have gone both into a playlist on just cast ons and as well as into a playlist just about the long tail cast on because I have done a number of videos regarding the long tail cast on. Sometimes a, a video might go into three or even four playlists, but the casual Friday videos always go just into one playlist and that playlist is called casual Fridays. So I wanted to let you know how you could go through and look at all my old videos on a particular topic if that's something that's interesting to you. So the first thing you do is you go to my channel. So when you're watching this video right now, underneath the video screen is my name. If you click on that link, then you just go to my main channel page. And from there, you can see where it says videos, playlists, and then there's a few other choices going across the screen. So you click on playlists. Then you can see all the playlists that I have for my channel. The one that you want, if, if it's Casual Fridays, is you click on Casual Fridays. And I'm pretty sure what's going to happen is the very first Casual Friday is going to start playing on the screen, but over on the right-hand side of your screen, so if you're looking at me, it's over here, there is going to be a whole list of, of all of the videos that are in this playlist. And at the very top of the list, you're gonna see a couple little symbols. One of them is the shuffle symbol. So if you wanted to uh, watch my these videos but just have them randomly select one you could do that or you could click on the, the little icon that means loop and what this means is that just like on Netflix when you get to the end of one episode of a TV show and then it starts playing you the next one that's what would happen if you're watching these casual Friday videos is that you could just watch them and it would play one after the other after the other until you got really sick of me and you didn't want to watch anymore. Now what I don't know is whether when you return to that playlist if it will pick up where you left off. I have a suspicion that that's what will work but I'm not positive. Um, but anyway I wanted to let you know that and how you can scroll through all of those casual Friday lists um, videos to see uh, the topics that I may have covered already that you would be interested in. So what I try to do is make sure that the title gives you some information about the main topics that I'm going to talk about. The only project I've been working on since last, uh, since the end of last week has been this baby blanket that I've been showing you the past couple of weeks. So I really do like the, the color block effect that I'm getting where I'm use, I use the caramel for the first quarter and then the middle half I use the red and now I'm back to working on the caramel again. So this is working out much better than alternating the colors every two rows. Haven't done a thing on my daughter's sweater. So this past weekend, I went on another retreat. Now this time it wasn't a knitting retreat. It was put on by, I thought it was put on by the Weavers Guild. That was the impression I, I had, although I was confused about, about the retreat, especially recently before I went on it. I'm a little confused about why there was so little information on the Weavers Guild website about it, particularly as the retreat approached. I heard about this retreat when I first joined the Weavers Guild and they had offered a free class for members of the Weavers Guild to find out more about what the Weavers Guild offered. So I know it was in that, in that class, either the teacher mentioned it or somebody in the class mentioned it. I'm not sure, but I know that that's when I first heard about it. And I remember looking on the Weavers Guild website and, and not seeing any information about the retreat, but if I Googled it, 
then I would, was able to find it and it would be on a different website that had a very similar name and I was very confused about that. And again, as July approached when I knew that registration would open, I still wasn't seeing anything on the guild's website, but in their in their week, I think it's every week, they send an email newsletter out about any, any current things going on in the Weavers Guild. And in one of those newsletters, they mention that there's an invitation to go to Federation retreat. And that was the other thing I was confusing. Why were they calling, why did the retreat have a name called Federation? That didn't make sense to me. Again, nothing on the Weavers Guild website. It was always on this other website and I could never remember what the difference was. I would Google for it every time. So this last Friday, it was time to go to the retreat. And I got in my car, I got on I-94. The retreat was in Alexandria, Minnesota, which is about two and a half hours northwest of the Twin Cities. And it was a beautiful day. The sun was out and the colors are really beautiful right now in Minnesota. And it was the first day in a week that we had had any sunshine. We hadn't had a single, single drop of sunshine. It'd been a, not just overcast, but sort of oppressively overcast and raining and cold and miserable for the, for the previous week. And I, I do not do well when, when there's more than just a couple of days in a row of overcast weather like that. I just, it really, I feel like I'm being weighed down. So I was driving along I-94 and I started seeing signs for Lake Wobegon Trailhead or Lake Wobegon this or Lake Wobegon that, which I found a little bit amusing. So if you, if you live in the United States and you listen to public radio, you may have sometime between 1975 and today have heard the radio program that's on the weekends called A Prairie Home Companion. And for decades, it was hosted by Garrison Keillor, uh, who he's, he's also a writer, but he would host this two hour radio program on the weekends. And it was sort of an old time radio program in a way. They would have musical guests. Often they were folk musicians or bluegrass musicians. They would do humorous skits about different things. They would have fake advertising for like the American Ketchup Council or something like that. And then there he would do a monologue every week. He would do the news from Lake Wobegon, which is this fictional town that he created. And over the years, the, the location of where it is is, a, is just about where I was driving along I-94. And, and I'd seen A Prairie Home Companion live several times while it was being recorded. So I know how he did his monologues. He would stand, he always wore this white suit and red socks, and he would stand over the microphone and he'd bend his head and he would, his eyes would be closed and he'd start to tell a story about the people in the town and what what crazy thing had happened that week. And every week he would start it by saying, well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown, out on the edge of the prairie. And then he would tell the story and then he would end it by saying, well, that's the news from Lake Wobegon where, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking and all the children are above average. Every week, the whole story was book bookended by those two statements. And I never really thought too much about what he meant by his town on the edge of the prairie. I mean, I live in the upper Midwest. I know there's a lot of prairie here. I grew, I was born in Iowa, grew up for a few years in Kansas, and those are the Great Plains states. And we're in the upper Midwest, but there's prairie. There are a lot of places around here, Eden Prairie, Lester Prairie, a lot of places named, you know, have prairie in their name. But I didn't ever really think too much about what that phrase meant until I was doing some genealogical research a couple of years ago. And I went to the county just west of the Twin Cities called Meeker County. And I was in a town called Dassel at their little history museum doing some research. And I don't know if it was when I was on my way in, uh, in there somewhere that there was a, a sign, something about the edge of the prairie or where the prairie begins or something like that, or if the volunteer researcher said something about it when I asked her. And I just had never thought about the fact that, that this is where the prairie begins in that part of Minnesota, kind of at this diagonal across the state. So, so I looked into it and I realized, oh, there were three distinct areas of sort of Minnesota geography and biomes. There was the tall grass prairie and by tall grass, like five, six feet tall. 
and that was in southern Minnesota, which is some of the best farmland in the country. And then there was this diagonal swath, 100 and 200 uh, miles long, of deciduous hardwood forest called the Big Woods. And it goes from across Minnesota into western Wisconsin. So if you, as a young child, ever read uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, the Little House books, Little House in the Prairie, Little House in the Big Woods, uh, Little Town on the Prairie, and the banks of, or the shores of Silver Lake, or whatever, all of those stories that were written by Laura Ingalls Wilder about her childhood growing up. The Little House in the Big Woods, I always thought of as, well, that's just, she was a child and she thought of, you know, there weren't very many other people living around and the, the woods were big and I just thought it was a description of a child's memory. I didn't know that it was an actual thing, that there was something called the big woods until I was, I was at that research uh, library and she was mentioning the edge of the prairie. And then, so not only did the context of Laura Ingalls Wilder's books make sense to me, but also Garrison Keillor's, Keillor's phrase about little town on the edge of the prairie where, where Lake Wobegon is. So I'm driving along in the sunshine and the fog colors and thinking about Lake Wobegon and the edge of the prairie. And I thought, oh, I can, I, I feel like this is the edge of the prairie in the big woods. There's something about when you're in the Midwest and you've been in different areas of the Midwest, you can just feel the geography, the, the differences in the geography. If you live in a mountainous area or in a desert or something, it may not seem that different to you. You may just think it looks flat, but it's not. There are some areas that are super flat, and then there are these areas of rolling hills. And when you get into Western and Northern Wisconsin, it's just the prettiest farmland I think you could ever imagine. It's so beautiful. Well, we have a third biome in Minnesota, and that's what we call here the North Woods, and that was Pine Woods. So there used to be this huge timber industry here in Minnesota in the 19th century and that cleared away a lot of the forest, but there's still a lot of forest still and a lot of, of trees that just naturally grow. So I thought about this and I thought, I wonder if Alexandria, you know, it's on the edge of the prairie, but was it in the prairie or was it in the big woods? And I looked on a map and it was just inside the big woods. And when I, when I arrived there, it was, it was just a beautiful day. Sunshine, the trees were all yellow, the lake was off um, just past the the main lodge of this camp where the retreat was held. It's a it's a family camp. The knitters retreat we were at a few weeks ago was a, a camp where in the summertime it's for kids. And so there are staff members that also live there or camp counselors, but it's mainly for kids. So the kind of accommodations can really vary. But at this camp, it's a family camp, so it's meant for families to come there, and they have room for RVs, and they have room for tents, tent camping, and they have all these different types of cabins. So the way this retreat was set up is there was a flat rate you paid. You paid $200, you got all of your accommodation, including bedding, you didn't have to bring your own bedding. Um, they provided all your meals, and there were three time periods for classes, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, and Saturday afternoon. And each one of those time periods, you had multiple choices. And as part of your registration fee, you got to pick up to two classes. You didn't have to take any classes if you didn't want to, but you could take up to two classes. Now, again, I thought this was being put on by the Weavers Guild. And so it was understandable to me that most of the classes had to do with some sort of portable weaving technique. And so I was looking for things related to spinning that, that I would want to do. And so Friday afternoon, I signed up for a dyeing class where we were going to be dyeing uh, combed top. And then for Saturday afternoon, I signed up for a spinning class called Spin a Bunny. And so we were going to learn how to spin Angora and how to mix it with other fibers and the qualities of Angora and, and all that sort of thing. Now, I hadn't taken out my spinning wheel for two months. I hadn't done any spinning since I was working at the Weaver's Guild booth over right before Labor Day when at the state fair. So I was really looking at this retreat as a way to get myself back into spinning again and, and getting excited about it and then just getting a kickstart on it. When I got there, I started to wonder 
you know, I wasn't seeing the Weavers Guild of Minnesota listed anywhere. And there's a big sign, Welcome to Federation Minnesota. And I started to think, you know, I wonder if this actually is put on by the Weavers Guild, because it would make a lot of sense if it weren't because of the lack of information on the Guild site. And it turns out that it is not put on by the Weavers Guild. Most of the people are members of the Weavers Guild, but it's just a group of people. The sole purpose of this group of people is to put on this retreat every year. And I asked, well, why is it called Federation? And it's because there is this, I don't know if there still is or not, but at least at some point in time, there was a federation of hand weavers guilds of Minnesota. So in different areas of the state, there were different smaller guilds and they would rotate from guild to guild who is responsible for putting on the retreat and that the location would change from year to year. And then at, at some point, a number of years ago, they found this particular location and it was ideal. The price was great. The classroom were were ideal the combinations were good everything you know it's reasonably priced all of this kind of thing and so they've just stayed there and they decided well instead of shifting it from guild to guild to guild to guild we'll just form a committee that that's all we do is put on this retreat and that's what they did so I you know I checked in at one o'clock two o'clock was my first class and so I went there and I really I have some dyeing experience. I've over dyed this one sweater twice. So I've, I've, I've dyed a garment. And at a knitter's retreat a year and a half ago, I took a dyeing class from someone who, one of the owners of Three Irish Girls. Uh, they make hand dyed yarn. And I took a class from her and it was dyeing yarn. And we learned different techniques, but we immersed the yarn in dye. And then we applied additional color and, and effects to that yarn afterwards. We could paint it on, we could splatter it on, we could do all kinds of things. So so I had done yarn, but I'd never done fiber. I didn't know anything about why why we were doing anything, like where we were going. It was basically at every step of the way, oh, now what am I supposed to do? Now what am I supposed to do? And I've mentioned before that my hearing shuts off when I get focused. So I was never clear if they had explained what we were going to do next and I just hadn't heard it or if I was just the least experienced person in the class and that's why I didn't really have any idea of what was going on. So what we were going to do, we each got four ounces of, of, fi of combed top and we could have more um, sets of, of four ounces, but we had a choice of BFL, which is blue faced luster or a BFL silk mix. We could do either. And we had to have, we had to pick three colors. We were going to be using three colors in our four ounces of comb top. And so that was the first thing that they announced. And that was the thing that kind of struck terror in my heart, having to pick three colors. But they had this really cool uh, color wheel that had a lot of options for how you could match up colors. They have the, you know, what's the complementary and what are the, or opposites, I guess, what are the opposites? And then, so the complementary where there's three in this triangle, and then they had a square or they had a rectangle. So you could match colors up across the wheel in different ways. And so I was really studying that and I was trying to figure out which three colors I would even want together because I tend to like the blue half of the wheel. I think the way my color blindness works is with the color shifting things on the yellow half of the wheel, I don't tend to like as much. Yellow I like. Um, so what I ended up doing was picking like uh, a purple, a really dark fuchsia, and then a yellow. Those are going to be my three colors. And so we had, they were, they soaked, they were soaking our fiber in buckets of warm water and then they were heating water on these hot plates and the water had citric acid and then one of them likes salt and the other one doesn't so we put salt in it and they asked people if you didn't want salt that's fine but they put salt in it and then they put a little bit of synthropol in it and that, it's like I don't understand synthropol the first time I'd ever heard of it it was it was a recommendation for someone who who had a finished item and didn't want it to bleed like they didn't want it to bleed into something else and someone recommended synthropol but then when i went to dye something like that over dye the sweater there was a recommendation to add synthropol to the water to help with the dyeing process so i i don't understand 
what the qualities of synthropol are that you would use it both to promote dying but also prevent bleeding i don't get it i don't i don't understand it so if somebody knows please let me know or at least point point me to some place to make me understand it because i don't get it so anyway we had some synthropol in this water so then we had to pick our colors and when they had these big jars of a powder dye and we could have masks if we want them and we could test out what the colors were actually going to look like. We had some paper towels we could spray with some water and then put a little few grains of the of the powder on it to see how it would bleed out into the towel and see if that was actually the color green we wanted or the color blue or whatever. And so we picked our colors and then we had a container that had like a cup of this warm, warm water with the citric acid and the salt and the synthropol in it. And then we put a teaspoon of our dye into that container and then we stirred it until it was completely dissolved. And then we poured it into a, like a plastic bottle, sort of like those ketchup, squeeze ketchup bottles with the little cone top to it. And so we put our dye into each of the three bottles. And then we took them to our table and they had, we were two of us per table and they had covered the table with these big sheets of, cellophane and like big saran wrap kind of thing big and so they had one on one half and then one on the other half that kind of overlapped and I didn't know what it was for I assumed it was to protect the table because we're going to be dying on there but I didn't really know what the cellophane was for other than that because I had no idea where we were going so we each they they had they had been soaking our fiber and then they had brought this um I don't even know what it's called. There's some name for it. It's like, it just takes all the water out. It's like spins. It's like the spin cycle of your washing machine, but it's not, but it's, it's an extractor. I guess that's what it is. So they'd spin the wool out and then they brought it over and then we had to snake it back and forth on our table. Cause it's, you know, it's pretty long, a couple of yards long probably. So you snake it back and forth on your table. And then you take these squirt bottles and you're supposed to put the colors on. Now some people, you know, they had the snakes going back and forth and then they would down the whole one third of it, they would do one color and then down the middle third, they do another. And then on the right third, they do the, the, the third color, which meant that along the course of the snake, this color would appear, you know, every third time. And, but I don't know enough about spinning to know like, what would I do with top light? I, I didn't know how to spin for that. I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I'm just going to do the first third of the snake in one color, the second third in another, and the third in, in, in the last color. And then I'll figure out, I can spin the colors independently, or I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, but that was, that was my plan. And what I noticed was that, you know, I would, I was squirting the, the purple on the white fiber. And then, you know, you get the little zigzaggy, just like if you're putting ketchup on a hot dog. And I, and I, and I use more and more of it. And I'm like, oh, it's not bleeding into its, into, in like, there's so much white left. I didn't know what to do. I used all of my, all of my purple. And the teacher came by and I'm like, well, I don't know. There's all this white still. And she said, oh, well, you're supposed to go through and, and push down on it. And then that will disperse the, the dye into the rest, rest of it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. And then maybe they told us and I just didn't hear, or maybe they assumed we knew, didn't think to tell me, I don't know. But so I realized when I was doing that, oh, I did not need to use this much of the dye. I had way more than I needed. So then the next section I was doing was the kind of fuchsia magenta color. And so I used a little less of that and I learned to, to tamp it down. And then finally I did the yellow and there was so much dye. It was like running in. I was having to get paper towels to try to keep things separate so they weren't bleeding into each other. And, and so then I'm like, okay, I'm done dying. Now, what are we doing? And they said, well, now you take the cellophane and you use it to kind of roll. And so then you're rolling the cellophane over the first part of the snake. And then you just keep rolling it up and rolling it up and rolling it up. So, so each part of the snake is kept separated by the barrier of the cellophane. So you have one big, long, thick snake like this. And then we rolled it up in a spiral like a cinnamon bun. And so then it, we had this big kind of spiral disc all wrapped in cellophane, put it on a paper plate. 
and then we put it in the microwave and so we did 70% for two minutes and then let it rest for a little bit and then another two minutes. And then we were told, okay, now you need to let it cool and just let it cool overnight or just take it home and wait to rinse it till you get home. So at some point during the class, somebody was talking about, oh, which colors are really hard to rinse out, to really get rinsed out. And they, somebody said something about red. And then the teacher said, oh, well, the brilliant violet is really, a, really a trick too. <laughs> like, oh no. That's the one I used so much of it to begin with. I used way more than I needed. And then it was going to be a hard color to rinse out. So when I got home Sunday, unpacked the car and I just started filling the sink up and I unwrapped the cellophane and just, you know, the water immediately went practically black because there was so much extra dye. And the, what they had told us to do was fill the sink up, put it in there and then let the water out and then just push the fiber up against the side of the sink because you want to be careful. It's really easy to felt this you know comb top it's much easier for it to felt than for yarn to felt or for anything else to felt so I'm like okay so I'm pushing it up against it and I fill the sink up again and then you know it's, it was taking so many rinses so many rinses so many rinses and finally you know I got to the point where I'm just going to let it soak for half an hour and it came back and it looked clear so I let the water out and I pushed against the side of the sink and it's still bleeding out water and I thought there's no way that this this fleece has or this fiber has survived this it's probably completely felted just from the squeezing so I thought I'm just going to really you know to get all the water out and let it dry and see what happens so and sure enough so here's here's my so, and, and the directions say well you know it's going to be all smooshed together you know really compressed it's, and and what you need to do is to kind of, you know, pull it apart a little bit and try to draft it out a little bit. And then, you know, get, and there's no way this is like, this is felted. That, that, that was, that was a mistake. But I did do a second um, four ounces of top. And this time I used greens. I wanted to kind of go from a dark green to a light green. I got the help of the teacher. It was really good with color, helped me mix the colors. And these were easier to rinse for one thing. So I don't, I think, I think, for, first of all, you can see how much fluffier it is and I can kind of separate it apart and I was able to, you know, draft some off the end of it. So I think it's possible that I might be able to spin with this. So this one, I've got these greens that go into, um, and it almost looks all the same, but oh no, this is like a more green gray, like a forest green into a turquoise. So we'll see what, we'll see what, I probably can't see it on this. Um, I can't see it very well on the monitor, but um, there's hope for this one because I didn't have to rinse it so much. So I made so many mistakes with that other dyeing thing. And what I'm seeing is that maybe I shouldn't dye fiber for quite a while to get more experience. Um, and really figure out what exactly I did wrong. Cause I think I did so many things wrong that there was just no hope of coming out of that class with anything that was usable for that first set of uh, fiber. One of the things that is, is so fun about a, a going to a place like this is that you really feel like I'm, I'm around my people. You know, I can go to the dog park in the morning and they know I'm a knitter and they know I've learned to spin and sometimes they'll ask me about it. But none of these people have any idea about a spinning wheel or why anybody would do this. And, you know, I was in the, the main lodge of this retreat and there was this big circle of people. There's probably 10 different people with spinning wheels and every one of the wheels was different. Like nobody had the same wheel. Like just, it was just really fun to see that and everybody seemed to have at least two things that nobody does just one thing so they may be most of them might be weavers but a lot of them are spinners or dyers or knitters or crocheters or whatever they or they might do needlepoint they just do so whatever they do a lot of different things nobody does just one textile craft that I have ever met so so that's really really fun and in the evenings, there was a, a library that I was sitting in and there was a couple there, husband-wife couple, 
and he was using his spinny wheel and I think she was knitting and they were chatting and it turns out we both live in South Minneapolis and they invited me to come to the knitting group that they come that they go to every Wednesday and they let me know more about the spinning group that meets once a month on Tuesday evenings because I'd been a little shy about going to those I didn't really know what that was about and it's like oh no we're always there and it's a great way to learn uh, more about spinning you probably learn more from just coming to that group than you'll learn by taking classes so i thought well that's really encouraging to know so saturday morning i did not have a class scheduled and so i thought i need to get reacquainted with my wheel before i have this spinning class and i had met the person who was teaching in the afternoon and i had asked her about one of the requirements for the class like we were supposed to bring half a bobbin of our default yarn she said you know that's not really important I ended up getting a lot more donations of fiber than I expected. So we probably won't get to the point in the class where we're going to need your default yarn. She said, but what's more important is that you get reacquainted with your wheel and that you're ready to spin when the class starts. So I spent Saturday morning sitting by these windows, looking out on the lake, just getting used to my, my wheel again. It was really, really beautiful. So then I took the class Saturday afternoon on spin a bunny and we got this big box full of different fibers. So there are different kinds of Angora. There's French and German and some was washed and some was not washed. And, and some things were blended with other fibers. Some of them were dyed and blended. And then there were just fibers that we could blend with the Angora. And we had these, she, she brought a whole bunch of them and I bought this little set of little hand combs. The cloth of the little cards was about this big and they have a little handle. And so you can just do a small amount of fiber at a time and you can blend the Angora with another uh, fiber. And then you could just spin right off of the card. It was it was kind of nice and they were, they were inexpensive and there was something that was uh, really nice to use. And so I learned, we learned quite a bit because we were, we were just spinning the Angora straight at first just to, to see what that was like. And I actually found it pretty easy to spin with. But what she told us was that you'd never want 100% Angora. It would be so hot and it would just, you know, it would not be a good experience. And that normally what you do is that you enhance other fibers with the addition of Angora. And it doesn't take a whole lot, maybe 10%. And you can really enhance uh, other fibers. And she gave us a whole bunch of different fibers to mix them with. Like we had um, cotton and we had merino and we had... I think some silk, a couple of different kinds of silk and different colors. So it was really, really a nice class. And during the class, she mentioned that she writes for Ply Magazine. And she, I think she also mentioned at that point the retreat that they have in April. And I thought, oh yeah, I remember reading about that. And s sort of knew that the registration was coming up soon. But she just, she just mentioned it and that was it. And then later in the day, I was back in the library talking to that couple that I had met the previous day and we were talking and um, there had been a swap after dinner. So people could bring things that they wanted to sell or get rid of. Some people really love to spin. They don't like to knit so much. so They sell their yarn. Other people had things that they didn't want any, any longer and they wanted to sell. So one of the things, I, I saw somebody had a knitting on it, and you might be able to see right here, there's a little bit of fiber sticking in. It's because uh, it's a little loose there, so there's some fiber stuck in there to keep it tight. She was selling it for like, I don't know, $15 or something. And as I went to pay her, I saw that on her table were these big balls of roving, and they had a very familiar label on them. It was the same... Um, person whose fiber I like the first fiber I bought that was not supplied to me by a spinning teacher came from her I'm like is this you <laughs> I'm like oh that's the first fiber I bought and then I made it into usable yarn and I actually knit it and made it into something so that was really fun so I got I got a knitty naughty at the swap and the woman who is running the retreat her name was she's kind of the chairman of the committee her name is Catherine and she had announced at some point that she was selling this book charka, book charka. And at some point she just kind of announced out, um, nobody's bought the book charka in last chance to get it. And the man that was this couple that I had met, he's like, sold. And so that evening when we were sitting in the library, he came in with this book charka. 
and he sat it down and he started using it. And I had heard of a charka. I knew they were from India, but I didn't really know much about them. So I was asking about it because I was watching him use it. It was, it's like, like if you had a, uh, a chess set or a backgammon set that was, you know, kind of flat, but you could, you could open it up and, and then there would be like an indented area that could hold all the pieces to your chess board or your backgammon set or whatever. It was kind of like that. So I was watching him turn this little dial and I could see there was a little spindle and he was spinning something off, off at an angle at the end of the spindle. And then he would line it up with the spindle and, and wind it again. And I thought to myself, that looks like a, a miniature great wheel, look like, like a great wheel. And so I asked him about that. And then he explained it was, it was um, something that Gandhi had really pushed when India was getting its independence, that Gandhi really pushed for these, these charkas that would allow Indians to spin cotton to make clothing for Indians. He really thought Indians should be wearing clothing that was um, made from cotton that was spun by Indians. And so these little portable um, spinning wheels were something that were really common. And they, he said there's an, there are other versions that were bigger too. There's one called like an attache version. So it's like the size of a briefcase, a little bigger. They come in different sizes. But it was really interesting to see it actually uh, in, in, in use and see how it worked. So while, while he was working with that, Brenda, the woman who had taught the spin, spin a bunny class, came into the library and she saw what he was doing and she went and she had a wagon full of all her supplies that she had kind of stored there. And she went over there and she pulled something out and she tossed him, tossed it to him. She goes, here, spin this pony. And pony is like these little rolls of cotton fiber that you use to, if you're spinning um, cotton. So she tossed him that because, and I didn't understand at first, why was she doing that until I later realized, oh, it's because it was cotton and he was using a, a charka and, and that's what you spin on a charka. So, so that was really nice. Well, we were talking about the Playaway retreat and she was talking about how great it is and it's down in St. Louis every year. And she said, oh, last year I had, I had to bring a Scotch tension wheel and an Irish tension wheel and she brought some other piece of equipment. And I said, well, how do you take all that with you? Do you drive down there? And she said, yeah, I load up my truck and I, and I drive down there. And I said, I was thinking about going to that retreat and I just, you know, wondering about the logistics. And she said, oh, well, um, you can ride with me. I go down for the, the whole week. I go down for the whole thing. She said, and I'm always looking to cut expenses. If you want to, I get, always get a hotel room with two queen beds. If you want to share a room and, you know, I wouldn't expect to be, you know, joined at the hip the entire time, just, you know do your own thing, which is exactly <laughs> how I would want to do it. And I got really excited about it. And I started, you know, looking at when registration is and, and they just posted the, the, the list of all the classes because the registration is, I think next weekend. And, um, so I was looking at them and it goes from Tuesday to Saturday. And I thought five full days is a lot. And cause, and I, I didn't want to, um, get burned out and which some people have warned about it can get it can get really by the end you can be really burned, burned out if you're trying to do something every day so I was looking at the schedule and I thought well I could see doing two days of classes at the beginning and then taking a day off and then doing another full day and maybe the last day do a half a day or something like that so I wouldn't so I'd give myself time to go to the market and look at what was for sale and do some actual spinning and socializing and and I could see, see that. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do for that full day? If I take a full day off of any classes, what would I do? And then I realized this play, this thing is in St. Louis. And I had been looking for a reason to go to St. Louis for about seven, maybe eight years. And I'd kind of put it out of my mind, kind of forgotten about it. And the reason I want to go there has to do with a brick wall on my family tree. When you first start doing genealogy, there's this rule that is often 
given to people who are new to do, doing genealogy, and that is start with what you know. Now, I didn't know this rule when I started, but it, it seemed obvious to me because how where else was I going to start? Um, but so I knew who my parents were. I knew who my grandparents were. And on my mother's side, I knew who her grandparents were because she knew all of their names. So even though I didn't wasn't quite 100 percent sure on all of them, she knew them. My dad he didn't necessarily know who his grandparents were. He knew a couple of them, but he didn't know the rest. So the other thing that we had in, in my family that I had to go on after I got those few basic people filled in on my tree is that we had my great-grandfather, Fred Buss, on his 77th birthday in 1940, he dictated his life story to my grandmother. And she typed it up, and everybody in the family has a copy of it. So that's what I went to. And I had read this before over the years, but so much of the information, I didn't really stick with me because I, I didn't really have the context for who the people really were and, and where they were living and what all the information meant. But I could look at this document and he had listed all of his siblings and in birth order. So even though I didn't know exactly when they were born, I knew when he was born. And then I kind of could guess, you know, a couple of years, you know, forward or backward. And... But I had their names. And in his family story, he also told the story of his father and, and his life in Germany before he immigrated. So this was the only immigrant's ancestor story that I had. And so one of my goals when I was starting genealogy was to figure out who all my immigrant ancestors were and why they came. And I assumed that they all probably all came in the 1800s uh, when everybody else's ancestors seemed to have come. I didn't know. So because I could start with my grandparents, uh, then I could look at the 1930 census, which at that time was the most recent one available. Now we have the 1940. And I could go back in time, back in time, back in time. And each census period get more information and more information. What I didn't know was what my great grandpa Fred, I didn't know what his mother's name was. In his life story, he told his father's immigration story and I knew what his name was. Uh, I could go back in the census records back to 1880 and find uh, his his father and all his siblings and everybody were all, but his mother had died when Fred was 10. And one of the things that happened was when their mother died, the boys, the four boys quit school and worked on the farm. And my great grandpa was the youngest of those four. He was only 10 and he was the weakest and the less useful out in the fields. So he stayed in the house and he took care of his little sisters who were I think three and five years old at the time. He learned to cook, he learned to make bread. He made them dresses by taking 100 pound flour sacks and cutting holes for the arm and hole for the head and that's what they wore. And so he took care of his sisters as they, as they grew up. He was, he was their mother. And it was really unusual. Their father never remarried. And at that time, it was very typical if a farmer or a wife was widowed, they got married as soon as possible because it took two people to run a farm like that. So I, I went back another 10 years and I went to the 1870 census. Now they had all been living in Iowa, but in the 1870 census they were living in Illinois. And there I finally saw their mother's name, Louisa. And the other thing that I saw was that their last name, instead of being spelled bus as we knew it, it was spelled B-U-S-S-E. And that didn't surprise me too much that there was a slightly different spelling because the census enumerators just would go around and ask people their name and they would just spell it however it sounded. There were no like rules of spelling like we have today where everyone's like, this is how it's spelled. That wasn't necessarily true. So I didn't think too much of it. But I had a terrible time finding the 1860 census by looking for bus or bus with an E. I couldn't find him, couldn't find him, couldn't find him. And I had to look for a neighboring farm family in the 1860 census and then look on the, on the page before and after to find my ancestors. And the reason I couldn't find them is because the last name was spelled B-U-Z-Z-Y. Buzzy. 
So when I found that out, I went to my knitting group and there was a woman there who as a child had lived in Germany for a few years. And then when her kids were small, she and her husband moved to Germany for a few years. So she was fluent in German. And I said, this is so weird. This is what I found this week. And they had buzzy and they had bus, you know, with an E at the end. And she said, oh, well in German, you would never end a word, a word that wouldn't end with two S's. And so it would, it would end with an E and that would be pronounced busse. And so I'm like, oh, and then I realized the story that we had in a family, not in this biography told by my great grandfather, but just a story that we had in the family was that the name in Germany had not been Bus. And we had this story where William Bus got off the boat and he was illiterate and didn't speak English. And he was, he met an immigration official or a clerk or whatever at the port who asked him his name. And this man didn't speak German. And so they just struggled as best they could. And the, the, the immigration clerk just wrote down B-U-S-S and that's how the family got their name. And I believed that. And the thing is, a lot of you probably have a similar story in your family that, oh, their, the name was changed at Ellis Island. And it's not true. Nobody's name was ever changed at Ellis Island or by any immigration clerk anywhere, regardless of what your family may believe. <laughs> and it may, once you, once you look into why that that's true, it, it makes sense. Um, first of all, the passenger manifest was filled out at the port of departure. Now in the Ellis Island years, Ellis Island was the first federal immigration processing station opened in 1892. Before that, for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, there were immigrant processing stations in some locations and it was up to the state where that port was located for them to, to process the incoming immigrants. Again, they were, they were processing them based on the passenger manifest that had been filled out at the port of departure. The clerks were not writing down anyone's name uh, when they came in at Ellis Island, they were checking names. They were, they were asking the immigrants questions and comparing their answers to what was, had been filled out at the port of departure. At both the port of departure and the port of entry, there were translators. They knew where people were coming from to get on these boats. And they had translators there and ready with the clerks. So there was no confusion about, oh, they didn't speak English. And we were a land of immigrants. Obviously there were people who spoke multiple languages and they worked at these federal immigrant processing stations. So I'll link to an article down below where you can read about how no one's name was ever changed at Ellis Island, if you, if you, in case you don't believe me. And it's just an interesting article to read, but I will link down to it below. But regardless of all this, William Buss or Wilhelm Busse arrived in 1853, 1855, somewhere around there. And at that time, there was no immigrant processing at all. You just walked off the boat. And in fact, one of the reasons the immigrant processing stations uh, were formed was for, for two reasons. One was to protect immigrants who didn't know what was going on, didn't speak the language, didn't understand what they were going. They're arriving in big cities and they could get taken advantage of, they could get beat up, they could get robbed, they could get killed, all kinds of things. So one of the reasons was to protect the immigrants and then make sure that they had a contact here who could come and get them or send them, telegraph money for a ticket, for a train to get them to the next place where the family was waiting for them halfway across the country. So there were a couple of reasons for these immigrant processing stations. Another one was to protect the community from having to take care of a person who wasn't able to work if they showed up or who was, had health issues like infectious diseases or things like that. So that's, there are a couple of reasons for processing immigrants, but no one ever changed anyone's name when they arrived here. Lots of people's names changed, but they did that on their own. And that's what I saw when I saw these census records were, oh, they changed their name and they changed it a good 20, 25 years after they arrived. So I had my great, great grandmother's first name, Louisa. I didn't know her maiden name. I didn't know who her parents were. And eventually I was actually able to find baptismal records of my great, great grandfather in Germany. So I was able to discover his parents' names. 
And he didn't come here with family. He was orphaned at a very young age. And by the time he was nine, he had to make his own living. So when he came to the United States, he came in on a sailing ship, not a steamship. So it was nine weeks on the ocean. And he came into New Orleans and then he took a steamboat up the Mississippi and got off in St. Louis. And we knew this. I knew, this is another story I knew. I had heard that he got off uh, the boat in St. Louis and that he went to a German church. And when he got there, they asked him where he was from and he told them and they said, oh, you need to meet this family. That They're from the same place. And then that's how he met his wife. That was the story that we had heard. Um, but I, we, I didn't really know if that was true or not, because I'd also heard the story about how the, the clerk had changed his name. So, but as I figured out what his real name was, and I could put that in my family tree, then I could search on things. And that, then I found his passenger manifest, actually found that. And then uh, Louisa, eventually I found out her maiden name from one of her children. There was some, there was a document that had mother's maiden name on it and it was spelled a little weird, but once I had that and I put that on my tree, those two people together with their names, I found the record of their, the civil marriage record in St. Louis in 1855 or 50, 55, I believe it was. And, um, and there was a little, little information about, about it, it recorded in the county records. And in the record, it said who had married them. It was Pastor F.R. period Picker. And I thought, well, I'm just going to Google F.R. Picker in St. Louis and see what I come up with. And it turns out he was a really famous pastor that the church that he was part of was really well known as a German church. And it was like four blocks from the port where the steamboat would have um, let William bus off of the boat. He just had to walk about four blocks to get to that German church. And what I discovered, so I discovered the name of the church and then I discovered, um, and I knew what year, what year it was, and I discovered that the St. Louis County Library had microfilm of the church records of this particular church. And so I thought, well, maybe they'll have the marriage record. Maybe the marriage record would indicate something about the, you know, family names. And I was able to get the marriage record. They, they emailed me the image from the microfilm of the church record. And it says on there uh, where my great-great-grandfather was from, which we knew was a little principality called Lippe Detmold. And, uh, and this was a record that was in German, and it was a lot of abbreviations. I had to get help from some of the German Genealogical Society to try to decipher this. And where Louisa was from, it just said PR, which we figured was Prussia. And I thought, oh, they always said she was from the same place. Well, I look at, looked at an old map and Lippi Detmold was a very tiny country and Prussia was enormous, but Lippi Detmold did border along Prussia. And then once I knew Louisa's last name, I could search these German baptismal records for for her and I couldn't find her but anyone with the last name that she had was all in this area around Schnathorst, Germany which is 25-30 miles away from where my great-great-grandfather was from. So they really were from the very very close um, the same part of what is now Germany. They, they, they really did both come from that same area. So what I discovered about this pastor picker was that in 1856, so just a few months after he married my great-great-grandparents, there was a division in the church and it split. And he left the church and formed another congregation. And I wondered if Louisa's parents were listed in the, in the congregants of the new church or maybe listed in the congregants of the old church. Maybe I could find them somehow. So I e had to email the St. Louis library about this once I got the marriage record and what they told me was we don't have the resources to do research and I mean I was willing to pay we don't have the resources you know you have to pay an outside researcher or come here yourself so it was something that it's been in the back of my mind for for seven or eight years that I need to find a reason <laughs> to go to St. Louis and go to this library and do some research 
So my plan is next spring when I go to Plyway, after I have two days of spinning classes, I'm going to take a day off and I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to look at the microfilm and see if I can break down that brick wall in my family tree. This Tuesday was the, the monthly Knitters Guild meeting and I went to it and I walked in and I saw my roommate from the Knitters Retreat from a couple of weeks ago and I went and sat next to her and was talking to her. And then the woman to my left was watching me knit and asking me a question about, was there a name for how I was knitting, which really confused me at first. And it turns out she was knitting a sweater and but she's a brand new knitter, like this is her first knitting project. And she, she'd been taught by a friend who had been visiting and then left. And so she didn't really understand how to purl. And she was watching me purl and trying to, is there a name for what, how you're doing that? And um, so we were, I was talking to her about different ways of purling and making some suggestions to her about how she could find a method of purling that might work for her. And she said, I've really been struggling to find a knitting group in my area. And I said, oh, where do you live? And <laughs> turns out she lives on my street four blocks away from me, which I was like, I said, oh my God, that's where I live. And she said, I think I've seen you walk, walking your dog before. It was so weird. So I had this, this sense of um, just sort of some knitting community right there on either side of me. And then when I got up to leave after the meeting was over, I saw a woman named Celeste who was, I was in a double cabin in the Weavers retreat. There, there was three of us in one side of the cabin, and then there was an adjoining door, and then there was a couple of women in the other cabin. And I had been talking to this woman, Celeste, during the Weavers uh, retreat, and I had no idea that she was right next, next to us. So I came in Saturday night, the door was open between them, and one of my cabin mates was over there. So we sat and had a wonderful chat for a couple hours until I couldn't keep my eyes open. And, we've re and she invited me to her um, monthly knitting group that's at her house, and she said, and there's some good knitters there, she said. So I was really, I really felt welcomed by her, and, and the couple that I met in the library had, had been giving me all this information about their knitting group that they go to and the, and the evening spinning group. So I really felt like, I felt like I was, I was home. I was in a community because with knitting for so long, I was so isolated that it was, it's been weird to try to put myself into the knitting community because I was so used to being separate and having mostly online people. So I knew when I, when I started spinning that I wanted to get myself into the spinning community uh, right away. And I knew that the retreat would be a good way to do that. And it really has turned out that way. And then the, this teacher that I had at the, at the retreat, the spinning teacher has invited me, has welcomed me in even more, inviting me to drive down and, and share a hotel room with her during this spring retreat. So I really feel like I've, I'm finding my community and it, it means so much to me. And so wanting to go to this to the St. Louis Library to do some more research on my family, it really struck me that William Buss, who had, or Wilhelm Busse, who had been orphaned as a child, came here alone, not speaking the language, immediately the first thing he did was to find his community and he walked that four blocks to that german church found his community met his future wife and it just it just all seemed like a nice little um sense of completion for me or something and something to look forward to um, as i continue my journey in spinning and uh and knitting and and involving myself in the various communities. That's it for this week. If you like my videos, you can support me by buying me a coffee on Kofi.com. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.